I'm going to try and keep this a little bit brief, at least for this topic this evening. Uh, welcome to the Matrixic Discussion Group call for Tactical Sovereignty. Uh, end of February here, 2022. Like I always say, this beautiful Sunday, the first day of the week, not the seventh and therefore not the Sabbath. And that's going to get into, I think, touching on a little bit of the same deception that we've experienced through our life. It seems like so many times uh, we're told to look at this or look at that. And, uh, you know, there's shiny objects put in our way. Um, specifically, I, you know, I'm thinking this evening about, you know, in the Patriot movement, there's always been like the obelisk. And the obelisk is something interesting to look at. Um, I'm sitting here this evening in front of the Arch of Servos that is uh, currently in Rome, uh, the real one anyway. But, you know, the, the obelisk, uh, sure, it might give us a sign or a hint towards maybe what God is being served and what's really been ruling things from the beginning. But there's something else that's been used from the very beginning as well, and that is these obelisks, all right? These obelisks do appear in a handful of countries, and there's even maybe a few um, smaller replicas, for instance, that yeah, you'll see in graveyards or something like that. And then those aren't necessarily like the real deal, but we know where they stem from. But something larger that's right in front of us that's found in even more places are these arches. And these arches have a significance that I've almost never heard anybody refer to or to break down or to describe what they really are, what they're really used from, why we see them in different places. And, and I find it most interesting that they aren't even really pointed out. You don't hear a lot of the teachers or anybody talking about them and, and really showing you what the significance of them are. And so that's really what I want to touch on this evening. Um, the title of this was A Return to Bondage. Uh, but it could also be subtitled uh, The Pharaohs Still Reign, which couldn't be closer to the truth because they really do. And it's just a matter of comprehending uh, the hierarchy of power and how power works. And, if, for instance, if somebody goes in and takes over a country all right, one country invades another, and that country is run by an emperor, then that means that they would take over that title of emperor. Uh, same thing goes with the different nations. You know, just because a nation is invaded doesn't always mean that its name has changed. It's just maybe the power structure behind it that's changed. And uh, those things can be seen, but uh, they're, they're not as, as prominent as, you know, hearing some of these titles. But you can see physical things that, that are used. And th these arches are one of them. And this stems from way back. And this goes to, I want to point out really a verse in Deuteronomy. It was a prophecy. And it was... God saying that he was going to bring the people back to bondage again. And the common philosophy or theology really that's thought on this is that this was already completed. Uh, this had already occurred in A.D. 70 when Jerusalem was attacked um, by Rome. But at the same time, you could say it was even attacked by Egypt. Because the way this is seen is that because Rome had first attacked Egypt in AD 30 and then went on to attack Rome, and you notice a lot of the same garb and things like that that went along with the Egyptians and carried over into Jerusalem, even into the worship and things like that. And people thought that that was the completion of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 28, 
um, verse 68 specifically. But the problem is, is that that prophecy that was told to the people, that was told to the church at that time, was that the tribes would be brought back to bondage. And people need to realize how Israel was set up. At that time, in uh, rather BC 30, um, when that invasion was taking place, that was um, the Octavian rulers that did that. That was uh, Augustus. And that, he carried on that name Caesar. He brought that name Caesar with him. And the idea of Caesar was that a Caesar was to be worshipped like a god. Where did this idea come from? It came from the pharaohs. Uh, that was a, another part of it that was dragged along with it. But in, in BC 30, when Rome had overtaken Jerusalem, at that time, there was only the tribes of Benjamin and Judah that were there. Judah is oh, where that name Jew comes from. It's Judah. But that was just one of the tribes. Benjamin was just one of the tribes. We know that there was 10 other tribes. But since then, many of those tribes had already been scattered among the nations, as you can find it written. Which means that what was brought back to Egypt was only two of the tribes. It wasn't all the tribes of Israel, as was prophesied. So this was yet to come. And this is what I contest that we're seeing today. And we can see the perfect example of it through these arches. Uh, the, these arches are regarding victory. You know, first, uh, Augustus went into Egypt, you know, uh, came in as a god. And then went into Jerusalem. And after that, it, you see the Arch of Titus that was put up in Rome. It was put up on a high hill in Rome to commemorate his victory over Jerusalem. And it's interesting if you go to your search engine and you can get into the details of that arch. It's kind of interesting as you look on the inside of it and you look on the walls on the inside and the decoration, the lift that is on there um, is depictions of the Israelites. Now, when they left Egypt and it's kind of, kind of a backhanded slap going back to when the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt many years earlier. And so they, Put that there and that that was part of you know their celebration or you know commemorative towards winning that battle and the invasion of jerusalem but these have gone on many many times um the, there's multiple arches that have sprouted since then um started like i said there with the arch of titus there's the arch of constantine which was his victory over maximus there's a um arch on the palace square uh, that that was an arch that was really showing the victories of the battles of napoleon all right um there's a wellington arch and wellington arch was you know a victory over napoleon himself uh arch de triumph oh, once again you've got napoleon you know um showing his great victories uh, namely Rome and Egypt. Uh, that, that was done in 1830. Um, and these go way back. Uh, Archetitus was 82 AD. And so you keep seeing these things sprout up all over the place. And, and I'd recommend people, you know, go do your own search on arches and look them up and, and look what they were put there for. It, it was all essentially an arch of triumph. It was a celebration of one kind or another. And so when you see Egypt having gone in uh, to Jerusalem and Rome having, along with them, having gone into Jerusalem, and then they spread out and Napoleon as well overtaking them and spreading out over Europe and conquering all these nations. I mean, it's not just a handful of places you're going to find these at. You're going to find them in Belgium, you're going to find them in Germany, you're going to find the arches in India, and they all mimic each other. And they, they've got kind of um, 
a rule that goes along with them, a hierarchy that goes along with them. Um, and the basic rules is, uh, number one, they're, they're placed there because a land has been covered, it totally conquered, and is now being ruled by somebody else. Um, they're also a sign of slavery. Uh, you see kind of a, a second rule to them, and it's kind of a rule of succession. You'll see a couple of arches in the USA, and there's the Arch of Washington that was to celebrate really the Revolutionary War and that supposed victory there. I'm not so sure whose victory that really was. I'm not so sure it was the victory of the U.S., if you do your research on that. But th that same year, 1892, there was also the Soldier and Sailors Arch that had been put up. And I, I found that was, that was just kind of odd as well. And later on, that, that was said to have been um, due to the Civil War and a commemoration to the fallen soldiers. And now, 1892, we know we're looking at about 30 years or a little less after the Civil War that that was done. And that same year, though, that the arch regarding the Revolutionary War was done. Even though they were done that same year, the completion of the Arch of Washington was completed first. And that was part of this rule of succession because that was the first event that occurred. And then later on that year, the Arch of the Soldier and Sailors was done for the Civil War. So there you see that, that little kind of rule of succession going on there. What has really occurred, and I've said for a long time that the U.S. is really wrong. I said that for a number of years. And in 2019... I happened to be listening to a broadcast and that they were showing a recent speech that was made by Benjamin Netanyahu and by Mike Pompeo, uh, secretary for the U.S. And they're both on stage together and Mike Pompeo is referring to the United States as the new Rome. And... I mean, just straight face, you know, playing out, laying it out there. And I look over at Benjamin Netanyahu, and he doesn't even blink an eye, you know. But it's being declared right there by Mike Pompeo. And this is the new Rome. Oh, why would that be? It's because of the succession of power. And it's declared every time these arches are put up. And it really started with Rome. And it went into Egypt, went into Jerusalem went into the rest of the world, and everywhere they conquered, they put these arches up. Um, one of them that I found that was interesting was the Cinquentaire Arch. It was supposed to mean a celebration of 50 years. It was 50 years of freedom, and it's in Belgium, and it's supposed to be freedom from the Netherlands. And if you look at the top of that arch, you're going to see the four horsemen. There, when I first saw the name of the arch, I didn't necessarily think 50. I, I looked at those four horsemen up there. And it's a, just a depiction of a chariot, a single chariot pulled by four horsemen. Uh, it it'd normally be like, say, the, the general of the army or something that, that would be riding that chariot. But you also stop and think about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You know, that, that really can't escape your mind when you see that as well. But I, I want to kind of break down that verse in Deuteronomy 28 a little bit. And um, but before I do that, what I'm laying out here is something that is actually able to be seen information that can be found, knowledge that can be found. Uh, there's so many times people talk about different things and there's really nothing to back it up. But I'm going to show you this. I'm going to show you 
and I have so far part of how these pharaohs are still reigning today um, through some physical evidence. And I'm also going to show it to you through something that doesn't lie, which is genealogical evidence or DNA evidence, for instance. I hear a lot of people try and kind of connect dots as far as how people were established uh, across the world and how different like dynasties were set up, different ones that took over, the different places they went to and took over after that. And a lot of them will use, for instance, like language. And to most people, that might sound like a legitimate way of following an idea like that. But you have to, you know, realize that language is something that can be learned. It's something that, you know, it only takes one generation really of people growing up in a different society than what their family speaks in a, in a language that is particular to that society. It only takes like one generation and all of a sudden now they're all speaking this new language. However, their DNA hasn't changed. Um, their genealogy hasn't changed. Their, their racial makeup hasn't changed. So it, that can be kind of faulty uh, using language as something to follow that. But I'm also, so I'm also going to show you that as far as DNA, DNA wise goes. First, I wanted to um, touch on that verse in Deuteronomy that, that many people go to uh, regarding this as far as AD 70 in the conquering at that time of Israel or of Jerusalem by Titus as being the completion of it. And it's easy to find it just the answers to it in that one simple verse, because that verse makes four major statements. And it's basically the, the only four things that that verse says. Um, one, it says, I will bring thee and talking about Israel, I will bring thee into Egypt again. All right. Well, like I said, when it's saying I will bring Israel back into Egypt again. When it's talking about Egypt, I mean, I'm sorry, when it's talking about Israel, it's talking about those 12 tribes of Israel. All right. I have to keep that in mind. It's talking about the 12 tribes. So, second statement. It's kind of, it seems obscure because it says, they'll shalt see it. No more again. It's like, huh? What's that mean? Thou shalt see it no more again. Okay, one is saying you're going to be brought back into Egypt, but at the same time, you're not going to see it anymore. You have to stop and wonder, what's that really meaning? The third statement it says, you should be sold as bondsmen and bondswomen. That's kind of easy to comprehend. And then it does the same thing as the first and second statement. The fourth statement says, no man shall buy you. And so let's look at those two sets of statements there. One, Israel will be brought back into Egypt, but it shall see it no more. How can it be brought back into Egypt and not be able to see Egypt. I'm going to break it down. It, it's, it's really, really simple. And they're going to be sold as bondsmen and bondswomen, but no man shall buy you. This explanation is going to take care of that as well. As far as that last statement, you ask why? Well, no man will need to buy you if you're operating as a bond servant voluntarily, you've, you've sold yourself. They didn't have to buy you. Everything today is based on voluntary compliance, right? So there you have it right there. That's why nobody's going to buy you because they don't have to. You're going to volunteer into it. You're going to volunteer into the servitude. 
and you're gonna you're gonna be a bond servant or a bond woman. You're gonna be conscri conscribing yourself. And regarding the first two statements that were made, that you're gonna be taken back to Egypt, but you're not gonna see Egypt anymore again. That's very simple, and I'm going to lay that out with the DNA I mentioned. Because what has happened is that instead of the people being returned to Egypt, going back into bondage in Egypt again, it kind of took a back door and brought Egypt to the people. That's what I was showing with following these arches starting back with the Arch of Titus that was put up after the invasion of Jerusalem. You follow these arches, and you can see how Egypt spread out throughout the world. Everybody is serving Egypt, following that Roman system of government, uh, following the Roman system of law. Roman civil law is the basis for just about all law today in all countries, definitely in countries underneath the IMF. It's very easy to find there. If once, once you look, it's like, oh, wow, the same concepts are followed. It, there's really nothing that makes it a great difference. You know, when you jump, say, for instance, you know, from a country of Great Britain to the U.S., for instance, I mean, they're all just following the same patterns, same ideas. So if we're going to follow the DNA as well, you know, part of what I started out doing in, in the research of this and part of what made some of these puzzle pieces fit together was that I'm blonde hair, blue eyed. Okay. And I think everybody goes through some stage in their life, maybe where they want to know where they came from, who they are, you know, Hey mom, do you know our genealogy or dad? You know, do you know the family tree and that kind of stuff? You know what I mean? But I saw uh, the blonde hair and blue eyes as being something unique, uh, especially when you start getting into researching things like RH negative blood and those ideas. And they all kind of start intertwining together. And I'm not much for today's version of science, you know, especially you listen to Michio Kaku and he'll tell you that, no scientist that he knows follows the scientific method, um, which in a nutshell, the scientific method would be, you know, is it measurable? Is it observable? Is it repeatable? You know, he says, no, he said, Mitchell Cock, who says, uh, we just fly by the seat of our pants. <laughs> I was like, oh, gosh, uh, that's what we're putting our faith in is people that just fly by the seat of their pants. All right. <laughs> but. One thing that I found that seems standard in science of even go back 100 years ago was an agreement that blonde hair, blue eyes, hazel eyes, red hair, it, it started as a genetic anomaly around the Black Sea. And I think maybe people are becoming more and more familiar nowadays with their maps uh, because the Black Sea lays, you know, north of Egypt, up towards the Ukraine area, you're going to find it at now. And it started as an anomaly there, and it, it spread from there. Um, and Mesopotamia area, um, you've got to remember that this was the general landmass area that Babylon was on. And when Babylon dispersed, and, and people possibly of this anomaly dispersed, they headed out in multiple directions as well. And I, I've been following a group of them that I traced back to that time that headed up towards, say, like the Dutch Netherlands and Ireland and further up into Europe and into England here about a year and a half ago, I was listening to um, a genealogical report that was talking about people from England 
and they were looking at their DNA, and they found that their DNA very closely matched the people of Mesopotamia, and specifically the pharaohs. So their their assumption was, oh, well, people from here must have gone to that area and become the pharaohs. And I thought, uh, no, you've got a little bit opposite. How about the pharaohs, when they took off, when they were conquered, they left and went up to where you're at. Because you look at many of those regions, and look at, you know, again, talking about the arches, you, you look at a lot of the architecture structure there, and they didn't even really start having castles until quite a while ago. It, you know, it, it's not like it's something that was always a part of their heritage. Um, many of the people of England and of Europe uh, lived in yurts. If you don't know what a yurt is, Y-U-R-T, they're, they're kind of interesting. And that was more of the structures of, of what they were living in and the tribal people were living in back at those times. And you look at uh, areas, say, such as um, north of Italy. Yeah, Italians are normally always thought of as, you know, dark hair, dark eyed people. But if you look at northern Italy, you're going to see that blonde hair is very prevalent there as well. Um, looking into, also I had mentioned like the RH negative factor and things like that, that kind of tie in to like blonde hair or red hair. Uh, I, you'll find um, the Berbers that this is referred to as them having a very high percentage. And I think it's somewhere around 30% of the Berbers had that. Um, but there's another group of people as well that, you never hear really identified as uh, having this trait as well. And when I found it, it I was kind of really surprised. Um, but it was the Kurds. It was the Kurdish people. And if you're old enough to remember, one of the reasons why the U.S. went after Hussein was because of the claims that he was doing things that were inhumane to the Kurds, among other people. But, you know, one of the things he had been doing what was trying to kind of quash the, the Kurds quite a bit. And so when I found that they had this trait as well, I was like, gosh, you know, maybe there is a little bit more to uh, that story when it comes to Hussein. And then I thought, you know, looking at just what's going on in our very recent history, uh, I go back to a couple elections ago. Um, I go back like uh, eight or nine, about nine Novembers ago. <laughs> you know, who was it that we had to vote for at that time? We were being offered a blonde hair, blue eyed woman, or we're being offered a uh, blue eyed, red haired man. And I just kind of chuckled and thought, you know, gosh, it's almost like Babylon just circled its way you know, across the world and right into the U.S., which only makes sense. Why wouldn't it be? Uh, because the same thing has happened here. The same conquering has been done here. And Rome has spread. And it's, like I said, it's spread into Egypt and through Jerusalem and into multiple other countries uh, with some of those other arches that I named. You can easily go and just look up these arches and look up the dates. And it's almost like following a road map. Oh, okay, they went here, then they went there, and then they went there, you know. Um, it it might have uh, started out in the name of Caesar Augustus, uh, and then Napoleon, and then later on, other peoples uh, that took over those lands. And we think sometimes maybe how far back that was and how, God, that was just so long ago, you know, so much has probably happened. Uh, none of this is really the case anymore. Well, you know, you go back to the Louisiana land purchase. I believe that was, if my memory is right, like around 1803, something like that. Oh, what was the Louisiana land purchase? Who did we buy it from? The United States bought 
that territory from Napoleon. And, and it wasn't just Louisiana. If, if you look at the swath of land, it was kind of shaped like a tornado. It, it sprouted out into a V up towards Canada. And which would make only sense because uh, being French, you know, so much was owned. So much of Canada was owned and controlled by France. And, and then that portion of land was controlled by France. Um, there, there was Spain here as well. There was Great Britain here as well. In fact, North America was called British North America. You can look it up. That name existed in our very near past, British America. And so this chain of events uh, of, of these people, these rulers, uh, a lot of people want to think of, you know, maybe say these secret families or these elite. It, it really isn't all that secret and it really isn't all that elite. If you just look at the footprints that they left you, look at the map that they left you, because they dotted the land with these arches as they moved around. I remember right after Obama became president, it was interesting. You know, it, it's like after somebody becomes president, it's like, what do they do? It's like one of the first things you do is uh, report into your boss or something. I don't know. But one of the first things he did is he took a journey to Egypt. And I remember he was standing there in, in front of a statue of one of these pharaohs. I think it was Tutankhamun. And he's looking at it. And he was kind of said in a puzzling way, he said, huh, he said, he looks like me. And if you looked at him, yeah, he did. You know, he had uh, the big earlobes, <laughs> you know, which is like a fingerprint. He had the high cheekbones. Um, unfortunately, though, the statement that Obama made was not quite grammatically correct because that pharaoh did not look like Obama, reason being, is because the pharaoh came along before Obama. A correct statement or more correct statement would have been that, gee, I look like him. That would have made a lot more sense because that was really the case. And, gee, I wonder why that would be. To me, it only makes sense. If these people have all just kind of spread out through the lands they, they've taken over these countries, uh, and Egypt is still ruling. These pharaohs are still ruling. Uh, their people still are in charge. Yeah, you've got, uh, what, Boris Yeltsin in England. Uh, there's another African crazy redheaded-looking dude, you know. And uh, you look at some of these old, old pharaohs that have been dug up, these skeletons, in some of these peoples of these royal families out of Egypt that have been exhumed. And what are you going to find? You're going to find blonde hair and red hair. You look at the architecture all around. Uh, you look at the lifts that have been painted and the things that they've decorated stuff with there. The buildings have been decorated with pictures of some of these people, some of these rulers and their pharaohs, people of the court. And they're depicting most all of them with blue eyes. Well, you're not going to see that with someone with dark hair. And so if we just kind of open our eyes and pay attention, you know, it's just like living, for instance, even a small community. It's kind of easy to see who's related to who. Oh, that's part of the Brown family. It's that's obvious. You know, you you can see things like that, and just it, it just stands right out because of you know traits that that certain peoples will have. And so much of this has just been put out there in front of us, and we've all been kind of mixed in, and the muddy the waters have been muddied so much that it's getting harder and harder to spot these things. But if we really pay attention to what's going on and who's in charge, you know. And Boris Yeltsin, I found an interesting article. He didn't like just, he wasn't like just born in England and he became one of their rulers, one of their leaders or whatever. And I, I found an article a few years ago 
that the IRS in the U.S. was going after, um, I'm sorry, not Yeltsin. I apologize. I should I don't tie in with him. Um, Boris Johnson. With Boris Johnson of England uh, because he owed back taxes. And that's like, wait a minute, back taxes? Well, they were claiming he was, since he was born in New York, that he held U.S. citizenship. And so that Boris Johnson, you know, while he was serving in government in England, should have been rightly been paying taxes uh, back to the U.S. or to New York specifically because of that. All, all these people are, you know, you could say in bed together one way or another. And if it's easy to see if you pay attention. And like I say, you know, pay attention to the DNA. It's a little easier way than following things than just following the languages people speak. Um, but also follow the roadmap that's been left. Follow these arches that are out there. And um, I apologize, Boris Johnson, for saying Yeltsin. But anyway, <laughs> it, these are things we need to open our eyes up to uh, that we really need to look at. But th there is one other uh, verse in scripture if you're going to use scripture for a history book to some degree that I think we should also pay attention to and that, that was in uh, Jeremiah 16 so in Jeremiah 16 it ma makes a very interesting statement it says the second exodus will be greater than the first well if the second exodus is going to be greater than the first you know what, what was the first exodus of people leaving Egypt. You know, it was just several thousand people. They probably grabbed a lot of the gold, things like that, took off with it. Basically, because Egypt was sick of what? They were sick of plagues that they'd been encountering. Sound familiar? Um, so if it would be greater, if the second excess would be greater, what could be even greater than that? It's the fact that all these tribes have been scattered among the nations. And these people waking up to that, waking up to who they really are, where they're really at, and where they're really from, and realizing the power and authority that they really do have and they really should be exercising, that right there would most definitely give you a greater exodus than the first. Catch you guys all next week. Something to think about.